We're going to hear a little bit about your thoughts, Bas. People living with Parkinson's really want. So please, could you help me in welcoming Bas Bloom? Um, and it starts with um, the fact that the uh, title's incorrect. Uh, because I wholeheartedly dislike the word patient. Uh, I think we should get rid of it. So we'll start with a, a bit of exercise in the vocabulary. I want to get rid of two words. The first word is patient. So let's start with a little exercise. Who is this? Prince. Prince. Very good. So Prince at one point decided to change his name to the artist formerly known as... Uh, no, he actually changed his name to the love symbol. But the media didn't like it. And the media said, well, we need something. So we call him Tefcap, the artist formerly known as Prince. Now, store that somewhere. If you now go back to the word patient, it comes from Latin, patientia. And patientia means patience, suffering, endurance. And certainly when the word patient was invented, um, all we had to offer was patience. You know, all we could do was wait. There were a few interventions. And there definitely was a lot of suffering. I spoke to a few folks who had deep brain stimulation <laughs> earlier. This is early deep brain surgery for Parkinson's. Lots of suffering. But I think modern people don't want patience. Um, you know, you want solutions tomorrow, today. Uh, you definitely don't want suffering or endurance. So I think it's time for a new terminology. And I just spoke to Emma and she said, I'm one of Simon's clients. And I thought about client, but I don't think client is, is a good term. It suggests sort of a business relationship. Um, so I, I think a better term is perhaps individual or person, but sort of tongue in cheek and thinking about uh, Prince and Tefcap, we proposed Tifcap, <laughs> the individual formerly known as patient. <laughs> and <laughs> And, and we've actually published about this. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm, de I'm dead serious about these things. Um, and then the other word I want to get rid of is honeymoon. Have you heard of the honeymoon phase of Parkinson's? So it's still prevalent. This is a, a lecture I gave recently um, for uh, Bial in Portugal. Uh, and they still speak about the honeymoon phase of Parkinson's. And the honeymoon phase was a term coined by medical professionals so levodopa was discovered in 1967. And in the early 70s, people started to discover that after a few years of a gratifying response to levodopa, fluctuations started to emerge. And then later on, dyskinesias came. And so doctors said the honeymoon phase is the first few years when three times a day levodopa gives you a stable response. And they called it the honeymoon phase. But Imagine if you go to a doctor and you hear those three words, you've got Parkinson's. How many of you thought, oh my God, my honeymoon has just started? <laughs> Anyone? So the honeymoon term was a useful term for intercollegiate communication between doctors to educate our students about the early, untreat early treated phase of Parkinson's. But I think receiving a diagnosis of Parkinson's is all but a honeymoon. It essentially destroys your life, your perspectives, your hopes, your future. Um, so it's perhaps, it is a honeymoon, but it's a honeymoon for the doctor because it's an easy time for us because we, we don't see you a lot, but it's not a honeymoon for you. So I think we should get rid of the term honeymoon. And we published a paper about this uh, in a journal to, to say we should get rid of the term honeymoon phase. Um, now, the other thing that I'm very passionate about is finding solutions for the future. And we do this in my center, in everything we do together with you. We do nothing, nothing for people with Parkinson's. We do everything with people with Parkinson's. So this symbolize, this is my multidisciplinary team. And in the first row is, is somebody who lives with this disease, uh, Marco van der Vecht, uh, as an example. Uh, but we strongly believe in co-creation. And this is a really interesting paper that we recently published about how to engage people with Parkinson's in every phase of research, for example. Um, when we think about a new project, we ask you, is it a good idea? Should I spend my energy on this project? We write the grant together. 
We design the study together. We optimize compliance together. We interpret the results together and we publish together. This paper is published with two individuals living with Parkinson's disease. And I will give you increasing examples of papers that I published together with you folks. So, and when I started to realize this, I, you know, as uh, Simon said, I'm a prolific writer, but I started to bin all the work that I did without you folks. I just, I'm destroying it and we're going to redo it and do it better. So one of my key messages for today is, it is essential for us as physicians, as researchers, um, as clinicians, uh, to, to, to listen to you very carefully. And I will give you a few striking examples of, that have really inspired me and changed my work. One of them is Sarah Regare. And Sarah is an individual, a woman living with Parkinson's from Sweden, and she did a PhD with me. She was the first PhD student who had Parkinson's herself. And she did a study on self-management, uh, which is really interesting, and about self-assessments at home, the pros, but also the cons. And what, this is the cover of her thesis. Uh, in Holland, we have this habit of publishing these beautiful little booklets. And these blue dots are the days of the year. And she added up all the minutes of physical contact with the medical world, the doctor, the nurse, the dietitian, and all together, it was one day, just one day, 364 days of the year. She's not a patient with Parkinson's. She is Sarah, the mother, Sarah, the PhD student, Sarah, the friend, Sarah, the wife. And I think this is such a powerful image that you're so much more than your disease. So I, I really like that. And we've taken this further in a book which has just been published in English. It came out in Dutch a few months earlier and it's called Holding Still Together. And it's really a beautiful book. It's for free, it's downloadable for free. Um, um, if you type the title in Google, you'll find it. Um, you have to pay for the physical copy. And it's, it's, it's a, a project that we did uh, in my university where we had people with Parkinson's and a healthcare professional bring an object that meant a lot to them. So I, I brought my sneakers because I like exercise. I'm, I'm, I'm crazy about sports. Uh, and this is Bob Bruns, uh, one of the people in my clinic. And he brought this brochure. He designs museums, uh, exhibitions in museums. And I thought I knew Bob well. And it turns out I didn't until we had this personal debate about his passion and his life. And it, it changed my relationship with him forever. And we had a photographer, a retired professor, taking these beautiful black and white photos. And the book is filled with these photos, as well as the personal stories of individuals. And these are other examples. You know, that she brings a camera. This is Omotola Thomas from Nigeria, who holds a microphone, which to her is the symbol of her voice for people of color, people in Africa, but also for women with Parkinson's. It's really powerful. And the most beautiful one is Naut, um, who brings his sound machine and he says, I am not my Parkinson's. Isn't that insanely beautiful? So what we ended up doing, I, I tried to be a bit of an artist myself from time to time, is we created a film uh, with all the photos um, that are in the book. And, uh, we, and it comes with a song and you'll recognize the melody but, the, um, but we created new lyrics, which I think are really beautiful. Give me the goosebumps every time I hear it. Just listen to it. Pregnant woman with Parkinson's. Um, you have one also? In, yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe you should connect it to Annalene. She's trying. She's collecting all these all the stories, and um, so there's a whole thing around female issues and Parkinson's, and uh, which which we still largely ignore. So we published a paper in the Lancet. It was an in invited review, a huge honor, and I submitted it under the title Parkinson's Diseases, and the Lancet didn't like it. Uh, but the point we made in that paper is that I really think there are 10 million Parkinson's diseases. There are different etiologies, different clinical presentations, but more importantly, your wishes and your needs are all different. So you all have your own Parkinson's. So people tell me, isn't it boring to just have Parkinson clinics? No, it's fascinating because you're all different and unique. So you know this guy, Steve Jobs, he made Apple very successful. And it's interesting to, to wonder what you would really like, what is really important. And one thing, that, that we hear consistently is your craving for information. I think that's why you're here together physically and online. And the one solution we've developed in my center is Parkinson TV. So in, we have got our own clinic, a dedicated Parkinson clinic, and we have our own television studio in the Rodbout, uh, where we broadcast web-based television once each month. It's a talk show setting always with an expert at the table, somebody with Parkinson's, a chair, and I'm sort of the sidekick, you know, who's always trying to say something intelligent about everything. And we've done almost 100 episodes now, and we have a board of patients deciding about the topics, and it's about work, sexuality, sleep, relationships, children. It's never about tremor <laughs> or about rigidity, which we think is important. It's about stuff that you like. It's in Dutch, so you won't be able to understand unless you speak Dutch, but we've done three seasons in America. Uh, one was recorded in, um, um, uh, in New York, and we had over a million viewers. Uh, it's on YouTube, so if you type Parkinson TV and YouTube, uh, you'll find it. Uh, and they're very useful episodes. This one was on dietary interventions, and it's really easily digestible information. And our latest season was called The Long Road to Hope, and it's a brilliant film that we did with Ray Dorsey's team in the United States. It's a documentary where you're meeting 12 individuals with Parkinson's. It's all, on, it's all freely available on YouTube. So the other thing people really like is personalized precision medicine, a care tailored to your own unique individual needs. And I will give you two wonderful examples um, that I think are amazing. This man's got freezing of gait. Uh, Professor Simon Lewis is one of the world's leading experts in that field. And what I find so fascinating about people with Parkinson's is they compensate for their basal ganglia deficits. This again relates probably to the cortex. So if he holds an imaginary rope ladder, he can walk. And we now know that there are hundreds, literally hundreds of different solutions, all invented by you folks that help you to move better. And one of the other solutions that this gentleman has identified is when he listens to Björk, you know, the, the, the artist, he doesn't even like Björk, he doesn't like the music, but it's the 110 beats per minute that do the job for him. And he has got this playlist of all these Björk, here, there he goes. Isn't that cool? But this gentleman also has Parkinson's, even in a more severe state. He's even unable to walk um, uh, with a wheeled relator. But what sets him in motion, and this is just goosebumps all over, is the opera Orpheus and Eurydice by Gluck. And then he starts to waltz with his wheeled relator. Now, in the first instance, it was the rhythm that restored a pathological rhythm. Gait requires a rhythm. In this case, the positive emotions, the beauty of the song, squeezes out whatever dopamine is left in the amygdala like a sponge, spills over into the motor circuitry, and he moves. Isn't it beautiful? The other thing that I'm very passionate about is what, I, what, what, what strikes me so much about Parkinson's is, is how your world shrinks. And this is something you all know. Your mobility becomes less and your world shrinks. Your speech declines and your world shrinks. You know, communication becomes difficult. 
oftentimes when you can't communicate easily, people think you're stupid, which you're not, of course. And there was one study um, from Australia, in fact, where they analyzed uh, GPS data from the smartphone and early diagnosed Parkinson's. People, when you plot your GPS data on the, on the map, they had a huge range of mobility. They were all over Sydney. And then Honey R2, sh it shrank. Honey R3, 4, until Honey R5 was a dot on the map. It was the bed in a nursing home. Really compelling. And I think my task as a physician, our task as a medical team, is to make that world larger again. That's my, that, I think that, that's the main task that we have, is to make that world a bit larger. And we do that using a truly holistic approach. I'm a very holistic doctor. Um, and I've often likened having Parkinson's disease to being a, an elite athlete. And I, I like that metaphor for a variety of reasons. I'm a former professional athlete myself. I used to play in the Dutch national volleyball team and uh, um, still very passionate about sports. And this is a wonderful image from the Ronde van Vlaanderen for the fans, the Round of Flanders, where the Dutch guy, Mathieu van der Poel, beats his Belgian eternal competitor, um, Wout van Aert, by, by less than the thickness of a tire. And the difference between the two is he probably ate just a bit better. He slept just a bit better. His stress levels were just a bit better. The differences between these two wonderful guys are minute and everything, everything needs to be perfect. Your bike, your massage. Now, if you've got Parkinson's, everything needs to be perfect. That's why I'm such a holistic doctor. Don't just settle for drugs. Yes, the pills are important, of course. Deep brain surgery is important. We've talked already about exercise. Diet is hugely important. You can't treat constipation without a high fiber diet talked about the Mediterranean diet. We're going to talk about stress in a minute, which is I'm passionate about. We've talked about the importance of treating sleep. There are at least eight, maybe 10 reasons for poor sleep in Parkinson's. If you don't sleep well, your days are terrible. If you wake up in the morning and you're tired, or if you have excessive daytime sleepiness, in other words, you tend to fall asleep easily during a conversation or while reading a book, it's invariably a sign that your nighttime sleep is not up to par. And you need to treat it. And if you treat the night, you have better days. I won't go into the full details, but there are, you have to systematically go through all the eight reasons for poor nighttime sleep. And it's treatable, at least to some extent. And we've talked about the importance of regular bowel movements. Don't settle for constipation, ever ever and this is achieved by a team and this is a cartoon that we published in our paper in the lancet and sometimes doctors still think they are gods in the team and we created this image to counter that misperception this is a universe and at the heart is a sun and the sun in the universe is you you and your family and in yellow are people who are always involved in care. It's the medical specialist, the geriatrician or a neurologist. And it's the general practitioner, the house doctor and the community nurse. Then in green, these disciplines are often involved, like a physical therapist or a dietitian. And these are the, we call them the new kids on the block. Uh, but think of a, a urologist, a dentist, a sex therapist, a sleep expert, palliative care, an occupational physician. There are, on my last count, 30 professional disciplines that can offer help. Now, that's not to say that all these professionals should be involved with all of you at all times. It tells you, A, how complex Parkinson's disease is, but it also tells you how treatable this disease is, provided you find the right experts, tailored to your needs and to your priorities. I think this is a very powerful image. And a component that we've just added to our multidisciplinary team is former carers. Really interesting project. So carers have rich experience in how to support people with Parkinson's. And if at some point the patient passes away, two problems arise. All that knowledge is gone and the former carer is sometimes 
falls into a deep black pit because you've lost a lot of meaning in life and, and, and purpose. So we've asked former carers whether they would be interested to support current carers. And not all of them were. I know of people who move on with life and forget about Parkinson's. But a, a large proportion was very interested to help current carers. And we published a book in Dutch, but why not send it to Simon and translate it into English about useful tips and tricks by former carers that help the current carers. Goudmantel project is really beautiful. I'm also very holistic when it comes to alternative medicine. And to give you the heads up, you know, we're into the vocabulary talk today. I, I dislike the term alternative medicine. I completely dislike it. First of all, anything that helps my patients makes me happy. I raise the flag, I, I launch the balloons, if you are treated by whatever that helps you. But that's not to say that I will prescribe it. I will prescribe medication or alternative or complementary medicine that I believe in. And you should be aware of side effects and costs. But just to remember to remind you, Digitalis is the most effective cardiac medic drug ever. And it was discovered by a lady who was regarded as a witch in England in the 19th century, um, or 18th century actually, until it was found that the foxglove, it comes from the foxglove, is a very powerful antiarrhythmic drug. So my, my strong conviction is, is there is one type of medicine. There is not regular medicine and alternative medicine. It's one world. But it's one world along a spectrum of credibility. And there are very credible interventions and there are interventions that have been poorly studied and that require more work. Does that make sense? And credibility has two dimensions. One is, is there a rational explanation? And levodopa has a high credibility because the lesions in the substantia nigra and the Lewy bodies in the substantia nigra, the loss of neurons, means you've got a lack of dopamine, which you replenish with the dopaminergic drug. And the second component to credibility is trials, evidence-based medicine. Has it been properly studied? And I've drafted this cartoon, which is really interesting. We're writing a paper about this as we speak. So on the y-axis is the chance of a treatment being accepted. And on the x-axis is the, the evidence, the credibility, if you will, ranging from extremely low to extremely high. And the higher the... Uh, the credibility, the higher the chance that a physician will accept the treatment and prescribe it to you. So, for example, um, swimming, uh, a retroactive prayer has a low credibility. And believe it or not, there's actually a paper published in the British Medical Journal about retroactive prayer. You know what retroactive prayer is? Somebody said, uh, you're nodding, but it's, it's, it's an incredible paper. Retroactive prayer. So somebody said, time is not linear. So, they asked a priest to pray for people who had been admitted to the intensive care 10 years ago. And the control group received no prayer. And lo and behold, the people that were prayed for were released from the ICU quicker than those without prayer. Now, I can already see you. This is hocus pocus, right? And I, this paper was also sort of tongue in cheek to provoke thinking about how to design studies and rational. So this has a poor rationale, let's put it that way. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, oh, and another example is swimming with dolphins. Although you might argue it could release anxi anxiety. It's a nice social event. It's a physical workout. It needs to be studied. There's a bit of a rationale here, no trials. So it's at the left end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum is levodopa. Well studied, big clinical trials, good rationale. Deep brain stimulation is a bit lower because it's very difficult to have an adequate control group for deep brain stimulation. So, but it's on the right end of the spectrum. And I think the debate with funding bodies, with you, and the debate between your physician and you is not about this. And the debate is not about this. The, the debate is about the gray area in the middle. 
and the gray area, and I've called it the 50 shades of gray. <laughs> you know, there are variants to this, but, uh, but there's a, and there are many grays. It, cannabis, big in my country, but you know about this. Mukuna prurians, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, physiotherapy, when I started my work 20 years ago, was at the left end of the spectrum, and it's progressively shifted to the right. So the debate is about here, should we spend money on it? Should we prescribe it? And one example that I wanted to mention is mucuna. Who's heard about mucuna? Many of you folks, but not all of you. So mucuna is an Ayurvedic bean, a natural product that contains levodopa. And there are quite a number of patients in my country who think, oh boy, this is a natural product. I will steer away from the Cinemet and the Madopar and I will use a natural product, not realizing it's the exact same levodopa. It's the exact same levodopa. There is even, this is funny, Mucuna prurians extra forte, the real power deal. The problem with Mucuna is there's a number of problems. It contains levodopa, which is rational. The problem is you receive Cinemet or Metopar because it combines levodopa with carbidopa or benserazide, which inhibits the conversion of levodopa into dopamine in your blood because levodopa can enter the brain, but dopamine cannot. Carbidopa cannot enter the brain, so your levodopa enters the brain, is now converted to dopamine in the brain where it does its work. Since there is no carbidopa here, a lot of the mucuna levodopa is already converted to dopamine in blood. And I'll show you a video of a lady in my, and I see many patients in Holland on mucuna monotherapy, severely debilitated because it's not a rational treatment. So this is a lady um, with Parkinson's on mucuna monotherapy. And I think this is quite severe Parkinson's, it's asymmetric. And now I added a bit of carbidopa to the mucuna and it's much improved. So now the levodopa contained by the mucuna enters the brain. This is her toe tapping without carbidopa. You, quite considerable. Here's with carbidopa, much improved. So that's why you need a debate with your physician about that gray area. And mucuna monotherapy, I don't think it's a fully rational treatment. It's not useless, but it's not fully rational. Another area that I really wanted to discuss is stress. And the one thing I really wanted to mention to you is that there are many people... Who of you has noticed that your Parkinson's first emerged during or shortly after a stressful period? Many hands. Many hands. And we hear that all the time. So this lady approached us and said, can, can I see you? Because my Parkinson started after my husband had a heart attack. So I think I've got psychogenic Parkinson's. You know, I'm making this up. This is all just distress. And what I strongly feel, because I see this all the time, stress consumes dopamine. So stress unmasks unveils a Parkinson's that has been ongoing for years and years. And that would have come anyway, but the stress just brings it on. And I'm telling you this because I see many people in my clinic who feel guilty or who look back in regret because they look at this stressful period. They lost a child and they developed Parkinson's. So now they've got two sorrows at the same time. And losing a child is awful, but it's not the cause of your Parkinson's. It would have come anyway. And an example of this is COVID. We've seen many new individuals with Parkinson's during COVID. And for some time we felt that COVID was a possible new cause of Parkinson's. It's too much detail for now. It might sporadically, but I think the, mo the majority of people had a COVID <coughs> infection which is a stressor, consumed dopamine and tipped you over the edge so that your Parkinson's came out. 
and just look at the video. This looks like regular Parkinson's. But when I talked to this lady, no, it, it, it's Parkinson's. But when we talked to this lady, she had the prodromal symptoms, the loss of smell, constipation, shoulder pain, years and years before a REM sleep behavior disorder, long before she developed Parkinson's. The COVID just brought on what would have come anyway. So we think stress is the final drop, and we're quite certain that stress is not the cause of your Parkinson's. Uh, new research by Rick Helmich in my group is also suggesting that stress, chronic stress, is not worsening the rate of progression. It worsens your symptoms acutely. It doesn't make your prognosis overall worse. Conversely, treating stress is really helpful. This is Tom Isaacs. I mentioned him before in my previous talk. And this is him with severe dyskinesias. Which in my textbook are involuntary movements. And just through complete relaxation, mindfulness, he's able to totally suppress what in my textbook used to be involuntary movements that are uncontrollable. It's really a quite remarkable video, I think. Isn't that special? And this, this is Tom. One more time, because it's such a powerful message. Another patient of mine, and by the way, there is now, there are good trials of mindfulness and yoga. So if you'd asked me 10 years ago about mindfulness and yoga, I would have said, meh, soft science. We're now doing really good studies in the Rodbout into mindfulness and yoga. Uh, and it's, it's becoming an evidence-based treatment. So definitely something I would wholeheartedly recommend. Another patient in my clinic, Marina Noordegraaf, said, what we need is not dopamine, what we need is hopamine. Isn't that brilliant? And, and she drafted this pillbox of hopamine tablets. And I said to Marina, ah, oh, we should publish this. This is brilliant. And we actually ended up publishing it. And I remember I was in Sardinia on holiday, sitting by the pool, and I try not to work when I'm on holiday, but I was so inspired that I typed the paper on my phone and sent it to her. And it got back with only red crosses, <laughs> which my PhDs don't dare to do. And she just said, you got it wrong. What you wrote was your hope. But hopamine is hope of mine. It's really personalized hope. So what I had written, I'll show you a video, we have a national network in Holland called Parkinson Net. And I'll show you a video of the moment where one person with Parkinson's gave the keynote plenary lecture. And then we all started to sing, you'll never walk alone. I mean, look at this, it's brilliant. <laughs> I thought this was really powerful. I thought this is hope of my hope I mean. But Marina said, that's your hope. <laughs> that's not my hope. Hope I mean is really hope of mine. And uh, we published about this. It's really worth reading. It's in layman's language. And Marina is an author on the paper, of course. Um, uh, and it's really about how you address personalized hope uh, during your consultations with your physician or your Parkinson nurse. Yet another patient in my clinic, Jos Voete, brought up the issue of silver linings. Another thing I wanted to share. And the silver lining, so Jos Voete said, is there such a thing as an upside to having Parkinson's? And I said, no, it's a horrible disease. And I gave it another thought and I realized I couldn't answer that question. I decided to post a video on social media and said, let other people decide whether or not there's a positive upside. One or two patients sent me an email and said, how on earth do you dare to raise that issue? You asshole. <laughs> and I approached them both directly. They're, they were angry. 
So I wrote to them personally and said, look, A, it's not me asking, it's one of your fellow patients, and B, listen again to the video. I, I recorded it very carefully. I said, you want to be cured tomorrow, if not today. But realizing Parkinson's is here to stay, I'm genuinely interested in this issue because if there is such a thing as a silver lining, we can use it in our clinical practice to, to help you better. So these two people were happy. One third of the respondents said, to the best of our knowledge, nothing positive. <coughs> two thirds said, we started to exercise more. Um, I cut back on my work, spent more time with my family. I've become an ambassador for Parkinson's. I'm helping out with the pesticide dossier. This is not to say you're happy with Parkinson's, but it means there is a silver lining. And the silver lining is literally that dark cloud with a thin silver line, but it's important to recognize it. So again, we published about this and Jos, Omatala, Larry and John are all individuals living with Parkinson's, authors on the paper, you know, co-creation. Um, another person with Parkinson's uh, is one of my patients, uh, Robin Broadhead, um, painted this, the figure one in the article. Uh, he's a pediatrician, retired pediatrician living in Malawi. Um, and during the, we organized a Parkinson weekend in, in uh, we do crazy things. Um, I won a very prestigious award last year, it's sort of the Dutch Nobel Prize for Science. And I thought I was so grateful that we decided to throw a party in the city for three full days. <laughs> so on 12 different locations throughout the city, we had 60 events, sit volleyball, book nooks, we watched films, we had conferences, um, we had a biological dinner in, in the church, we had a concert, we had a song released, a poem released. I mean, and the list goes on and on. I did walking lectures with patients along the River Rhine, and I mean, it was insane. But one of the highlights was a concert in this church. It's a beautiful old church in the center of the city. And I asked Sophia Dracht, a wonderful Dutch artist, if she could write me a song about silver linings. And it was released during the weekend, and I'll just give you a brief clip. Eh? the silver linings so stream it on Spotify it's a really cool song Sophia Dracht so obviously the ultimate dream of all of you is that we have disease modification slowing of disease progression M the good news is there are many 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 drugs being tested for disease modifying potential in the world uh, my center is doing several trials, typically pharma-driven. The intervention that's closest to delivering that promise is exercise, as we talked about earlier this morning. Aerobic exercise and also the volume of activities. That's the closest. The rumor had it, when I was in Copenhagen, that there will soon be a trial in the New England Journal of Medicine of the first drug that will slow down Parkinson's. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it, but I say in every interview I give on Dutch television or radio, curious to see if Simon would agree, I think that before I retire, we will see the first disease modifying drug. That's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. But do you share my hope? I absolutely share your hope. Good. I'm here to give you a bit of hope, right? Hope, I mean. Um, but exercise is the closest to delivering that promise. But drugs are also underway. And ultimately, you want the cure. Right? This is from my, the Dutch version of my book, the, the, the famous artist, uh, Marina Noordegraaf. Um, you, you want a cure. I, realistically, I don't think the cure is near. Stem cells are not a cure. There's good hope. There are major developments for stem cells. The good news is stem cells can be told to change their behavior into becoming a dopamine neuron, to choose a career in dopamine. Um, they survive, 
they sprout. What is still a challenge is, let me see if I can use a metaphor. Um, if you go from here to Bondi Beach, there's probably a two-lane road. If you go from here to Melbourne, there's probably a four-lane road, I can imagine. No? <laughs> Maybe more? But, but. Anyways. In, in Holland, we've got these big, anyway. So if you, the metaphor is if you remove all the asphalt, is that an English word, asphalt? Yeah. The, if you remove all the asphalt in Sydney, the good news is if I put a stem cell somewhere in the center of Sydney, it will produce roads, asphalt roads. It will sprout and it will branch. That's the good news. But how do we tell that stem cell that you need a small road to Bondi Beach and a big long road to Melbourne? That is still a challenge. So in the older trials, already dating back to the 90s, the trials failed because, for example, the slow right arm received sprouting from the stem cells and was cured, but the left arm, which was better, didn't need extra dopamine, also received the same dose. It also received the road to Melbourne and now became dyskinetic. They were called runaway dyskinesias. That issue has not been properly solved yet. Roger Barker, a famous neurologist from Cambridge in England, is doing trials that I trust. I trust Roger. I would, he could treat my mother. Um, and I hope that, again, during our career and lifetime, we will see stem cells. But stem cells are not a cure for Parkinson's. It's bringing a dopamine factory into your brain so you have a local production of dopamine that's probably more stable. So it's a symptomatic treatment. And we've also seen people who died after many years after having received a graft and where the graft was attacked by the disease process. So whatever is causing Parkinson's in your brain, it also attacks the graft. So it's spreading like an oil stain. So it's not a cure, um, but I think disease modification, better quality of life, taking you seriously as individuals, that's within reach. That's definitely within reach. And I just want to conclude this talk so we have ample time for discussion. Going back to Nout, you remember Nout from the book. Nout said, I'm not my Parkinson's. And Nout said something else that I think is very important and very close to my heart. This is what Nout says. Thank you. Wonderful. So I'm looking online. I can see a couple of comments and questions that have come through. Um, you talked of disease modification and you talked of volume of activities. Um, I, I've, I've got a fair idea what you mean by volume, but I'm, Sorry, not, too right in the but I'm not too sure. Okay. Volume of activities. The, the, the volume of activities is best explained by step counts. Do you track your step count with a smartwatch or your smartphone? Number of, uh, number of steps per day. Uh, I, so, I used to, but uh, I, I walk a lot. So. Okay, so volume of activities is even at a leisure pace. Taking 6,000 steps or walking three kilometers is better than walking two kilometers. 6,000 steps at a leisure pace is better than 4,000 steps. That's what I mean by volume of activities, even at a leisure pace. And a second independent component is the intensity. That's the aerobic component, that's mm -hmm. the panting. Bass online, just quickly, there's also a question about speech therapy. I know this is one of your big areas. Yeah, so speech and language therapy, I think, is crucial. I talked about the shrinking world, partially because of dysarthria. Speech language therapy, there's now good evidence that this is effective. And what I should say is we're submitting, you're probably going to say not again, but we're submitting a big trial to Lancet Neurology. We compared, because speech language therapy is rather intense. It's oftentimes three to four, maybe five days per week. The trick is that the speech language therapist teaches you how to do it, so you can do it yourself. And this is a vast country. So the trial that we just did, and we're ready to submit, is we did a randomized clinical trial of usual care versus remote speech language therapy through the screen. And it was as good as in-person speech language therapy. And 
What you should all download, no, you shouldn't, but what you can consider downloading <laughs> is the Voice Trainer app. It's literally called the Voice Trainer app, and it is developed by our top-notch speech-language therapist. It's a green circle on the screen. If you speak too high, it becomes red, because if you speak louder, your pitch goes up. That's not the intention. You speak loud and low. So the, the, the circle goes up if you speak loud enough, and it turns red if you speak too high. So the speech language therapist will tweak it, teach you how to do it, and you can secretly keep the phone and see whether you're speaking at the right tone. Because one of the interesting, fascinating things about Parkinson's is people with Parkinson's don't hear their own voice properly. They think they speak loud enough, but they don't. And now you can hold it and, and get auditory feedback. And the name of the app again, one more time. The Voice Trainer app. So Google Store, Google Play, iPhone yeah. app. So for free. For free. I'll take this one first and then we've got another one there. You talk about physical exercise. What, do you, what are your thoughts on cognitive exercising? Ah. Yeah, I, I received $10 for that question. <laughs> no, I was supposed to give you. No, no, you, no, I was going to give you $10. That's right. Bummer. Bummer. Um, no, so um, uh, I, 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 it's a brilliant question. You asked me during uh, coffee and I said repeat it here. Uh, uh, cognitive exercise is as important as physical exercise. Use it or lose it. And uh, uh, for example, trials have shown that bridge, the card game, is associated with a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Mm. We just published a paper with a French group in Journal of Neurology that if you gamify cognitive exercises, I mean, children do games all the time. Mm. If you gamify your cognitive training by doing literally games, um, you train your brain and it preserves cognitive abilities much better than if you don't. So cognitive exercise, staying mentally active, engaging in conversations, playing games, card games, computer games, very helpful. And so. Thank you. Bus, this morning you said, over here, you, you, you mentioned that you largely diagnose people with Parkinson's physically. It's a very simple manual process. And I, I think the diagnostic criteria still is three motor symptoms over a period of X number of years. Now, if exercise is such a powerful intervention and is disease modifying, and we, we recognize non-motor symptoms a decade or more before, why hasn't the diagnostic criteria evolved and caught up? And why aren't we intervening sooner? Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question, Wayne. And so first of all, we currently diagnose Parkinson's based on motor symptoms, but you're absolutely right. The non-motor symptoms are part of the syndrome and often antedate the diagnosis. So REM sleep behavior disorder, loss of smell, constipation uh, are years, years ahead of Parkinson's. Um, the diagnostic criteria are about to change. Uh, we both just came back from Copenhagen where there were literally hefty debates about the new diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's. You will hear about this soon. It's gonna change quite dramatically, but it's gonna change for trials and not for care. This is important because this went wrong in the Alzheimer field. In the Alzheimer field, if you carry an abnormal amyloid protein, you're diagnosed with Alzheimer disease, even though you may never become sick. That's gone wrong. The equivalent in the Parkinson's field is alpha-synuclein and testing for alpha-synuclein combined with dopamine scans and testing for your genetic profile will be the new Parkinson's even without symptoms or even with only mild non-motor symptoms. But it will allow us to include people in trials earlier. It will probably not affect care in the near future. Do you see it the same way? Yes, yes, and of course I've got that's good. No, no. And of course, I'd, I would flag we've got the, the world's first um, trial targeting the isolated RBD patients that will start here in Sydney next month um, with a partnership with Michelle Hu uh, from Oxford. Um, but we're, we're leading that with um, Parkinson's UK money. At the back, we'll go there first. Hi, thank you. I love your hopamine. I've got one for you. Love a dopa. Um, with regards to sleep, I'm looking to improve mine. You mentioned the eight. Ch eight Things on a checklist. Where do I find out more information about that? Um, can you remind me about the Lovadopa? <laughs> I love it. I like it. 
Um, uh, we published a paper. Um, um, if you search under my name, I publish a lot. But if you combine it with sleep and over aim, O V E R E E M, uh, there's a very nice paper in Journal Neurology, a review paper. And the heart is a table, and it lists in column one the eight problems, in column two how you find it, in column three how you treat it. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned Makuna and um, combining it with levodopa, um, but th they're not uh, with doing carbidopa. that. Car yeah, that, that, that's what I wanted to ask, wh whether that's something they're doing, they're looking into, because you said you gave her extra cardidopa, and I haven't seen that. Yeah, so about. the interesting thing is I have about eight patients in my clinic who take Makuna combined with carbidopa. And um, that makes it a rational treatment. At the same time, and this is between us, they are now using a chemical compound, so they, they want the, 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 the pros of the natural product, but they still need the chemical compound mm -hmm. to make it work. So it's a bit counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some remote reason to believe that Mikuna is a bean, and it contains not just levodopa, it contains a host of other chemicals, which could potentially do something well, but that's never been properly studied. So I tell most people, take Cinemet or Madopar because you know exactly how much levodopa is in there. The other problem is it's a powder and it's poorly controlled. It doesn't have all the quality criteria. If you strongly feel about Makuna, go ahead and do it, but combine it with a decarboxylase inhibitor. I guess the question is why are there, is there not much research going into that? Yeah, the, there's no patent. There's no, there's no rich industry behind it. Great, thank you. The one place that's doing that, of course, is Africa. So yeah. they're yeah, investing in Africa because it's cheaper. And we'll take a question here, yeah. and then Carl, if we can get the microphone over there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And, and, and then the Africa idea is that Mukuna is better than nothing. So they're, they're testing it in Africa without carbidopa, thinking, and, and, and that's probably true. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Go. My question is about neuroplasticity. And rewiring your brain and making it work better in different pathways. Is there any research or projects about how that's happening in Parkinson's? Yeah, so first of all, I talked about the exercise. Aerobic exercise is the way to protect your cortex and to promote that rewiring. So that's why you should really exercise and be motivated to the bone to keep exercising. What we are brainstorming about in my center is whether combining physiotherapy with, for example, direct transcranial current stimulation, it's, it's, it's putting a, a, an electrical current through your brain, or maybe team, team at transcranial magnetic stimulation. So stimulation techniques of the cortex might help to promote it. That's theory, and that needs further study. Uh, Carl, on the end of that round, I think is. Hello, I'm a bushwalker. I've walked all my life. I live in a terrace house, two stairs, and I hitchhike. And I don't have a car. But do I need one of those stopwatches? I mean, I, ah. mean, I, I, can't, well, I, I can't afford it. And I mean, I know how fast I walk and how I walk. Have I really need well, to time myself after all these years? Well, you know, um, it's... I'll, I'll let you into a secret. She's a knowledge no, area. I know, I know. I was going to say, it's never, it's never appropriate to disclose a woman's age um, <laughs> without being, you know, pain. But she actually is 90 years old and looks terrific. I guess she was 63. She looks, and she's actually 90. I, I due, think a smart That's due watch, to all the walking. I start to yeah. walk my mother after dinner at night when we're eight. We have dinner, we'd wash up and we'd walk. There you go. And we walk with the dog. Living proof about the benefits of exercise. I think a smart watch is poorly spent on you. <laughs> and I... And I do weights. <laughs> and champagne. I drink champagne and do weights. <laughs> and I love men. And I love men. <laughs> That's the recipe. That's the recipe. Um, we've developed a model in Holland that addresses your exact question. So I think what everybody with Parkinson's deserves is an expert. This disease is way too complex to be left in the hands of a generally trained person. 
with all respect for people who are generically trained, they're important, but Parkinson's deserves expertise. At the same time, an expert on an island is a danger as a threat to healthcare. So Bas Bloom is a threat to healthcare because I don't recognize the flu anymore. I see a nail because I'm a hammer and I see a nail in everything I see, right? So you need experts for your dedicated Parkinson problems and you need a generalist for general oversight. That's your general practitioner. And in answer to your question, we developed a model in Holland and some models are good and others are wrong. And we have a model that we feel might work. And we've got some good evidence to support it. And it's called Parkinson Net. And the good news is Parkinson Net is coming to Australia. So the essence of Parkinson Net is three pillars. One pillar is we train professionals with a three-day intensive training course to become really good in Parkinson's care according to the latest evidence and according to recent guidelines. It's an intense three-day course. We also educate you folks, for example, through Parkinson TV. And importantly, we train the professionals to work together with other professionals. We tell the physio what an OT can do and vice versa. We bring them together in a room. We teach them how to work in a multidisciplinary way and how to involve people with Parkinson's as part of the team. Those are the three pillars. So this is the Netherlands. I always say it's a gargantuous country, <laughs> 200 miles from north to south, 100 miles east to west. Nijmegen is just about here. Blanca is working here, right, in mm -hmm. Maastricht. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's covered with a whole Parkinson net. We've trained now over 4,000 professionals in my country. 19 disciplines out of the 30 have now been trained. The three-day basic training is according to guidelines. And we've published all those guidelines, and they're freely available through our website. Most of them are now available in English. So three-day, we lock people up and make them better and better and better in Parkinson's. But the problem is, if you train people, and if you don't subsequently apply it in clinical practice, you'll lose that knowledge. So the other component, and I'll come to that in a minute, is we concentrate care among those experts so they become better and better and better. So after the three-day training, it's compulsory if you want to stay a member of Parkinsonet to have three follow-up courses in your own region each year and to attend our annual national conference. And Professor Simon Lewis was one of our keynote speakers. And you've seen it. You, you heard the song, You'll Never Walk Alone. It's become a movement. Mm -hmm. The moment you open the sliding doors, Everybody's passionate about Parkinson's. Physios meet other physios, but they meet the OTs, the dietitians, And once you know each other's face, collaboration becomes easier, right? We also connect our professionals 24-7 on the Facebook of healthcare, which we call Parkinson Connect. And for, just as an example, I'll just, because we have the time now, we had a, a physiotherapist in Groningen, in the far north, he said, I have a patient with a bad tremor and he can't use the computer mouse because it's bouncing off the table. Post the message in Parkinson Connect. 30 minutes later, an occupational therapist in the complete other side of the country says, in the gaming industry, there are extra heavy computer mouses. Can you, and it was the solution. And the lovely thing about Parkinson's Connect is, A, they would never have found each other without it. <laughs> B, that knowledge is now retrievable. So we create an encyclopedia of new knowledge. So the network is self-learning and continues to improve and improve. What we use is the healthcare finder. Any Dutch patient can access this website. You can type your zip code or your city. You can say, I want a speech language therapist. I want to find this person in no more than 10 kilometers. And then search. Google map will give you an overview of the people trained by my network, who you know are experts. You can even review their offerings, their years of experience, their passion, where they work. And patients use this website, it's called the Parkinson search engine, to build their own network. 
Isn't that beautiful? Mijn naam is Hanneke Kalf, ik ben logopedist. And she explains her passion and why she's so... And what is happening now is we publish this. Parkinson net gets better year in, year out. On the y-axis, you see the proportion of people treated by our network. So we're not necessarily saying we want more physiotherapy. What we want is if you go to a physiotherapist, go to an expert in this network. And you see it gets better year in, year out. Unlike most innovations in healthcare, which after the peak of inflated interest collapse, Parkinson it really is like a bottle of wine. It gets better year in, year out, although ultimately you need to consume it, of course. Uh, then we've got Parkinson TV, you've heard this story. And what I'm proud to say is, this is not just a dream, it exists in Holland. And these are all trials in top quality journals. Lancet Neurology, British Medical Journal, to show converging evidence that together this network leads to better care. People know about guidelines. They treat a high caseload. If you now go to a physiotherapist in Parkinson's, you, you see 90 other patients in the clinic. And the physiotherapist knows that you're also treated by an OT and a speed, and they know each other, and they work together as a team. We've shown that in Holland, there is a 50% reduction in hip fractures, because the good physios avoid falls. The good OTs make the home safer. The good speech language therapists avoid aspiration pneumonia. And it saves Holland each year 20 to 30 million euros in prevented complications. It's insane. No, it's and the, our latest paper, I, I showed it yesterday, it's, re, it's, it's, it's in movement disorders, it's our lead journal. We showed two really interesting things. All the trials so far looked at the, the whole multidisciplinary network. In the latest study, we looked at what each discipline was doing. And what is really cool is physios specifically prevent hip fractures. But speech language therapists who look at swallowing specifically prevent aspiration pneumonia, which is an important cause of death for people with Parkinson's. And, and this is really cool, if more than one discipline was involved who worked together, the results were synergistically better. So one and one is three. And this is literally the first trial in the world to show that multidisciplinary care is not just the sum of the components, it leads to better care. And what we're now saying to payers is the cost, you know, I, and I, the, 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 the one thing I always say when I show this slide is, I'm a professor of neurology, I'm a civil servant, I have a standard income, I'm not a businessman. But you need to run a business to understand the merits of Parkinson's net. And this is our business case. The cost savings are immense in blue. But what many people don't realize is a network costs a bit of money. Just like a hospital, there's overhead. Our annual training, the regional trainings three times a year, the maintenance of our IT, our Parkinson TV programs, update of the guidelines. You know, a network costs a bit of money, but the costs are about a million each year. The savings is about 20 to 30 million each year. So when I showed this to the Minister of Health in Norway, he said, where can I sign? All of Norway now has Parkinson's net. All of Luxembourg now has Parkinson's net. We are now doing trainings in Luxembourg, and, and, sorry, in Germany, trainings in China, and the good news is, we're working together with the folks in Melbourne to do the first Parkinson's net network in Melbourne. The one other thing that we learned is it's not copy-paste. So uh, we actually have a network in California with Kaiser Permanente. And what we've learned is we are much like subways. You know subways, right, where you can get your sandwich. You build your own customized sandwich. So when we... When we went to Melbourne, we didn't say, this is the Dutch network, take it or leave it. The first thing we do is, what is already good in Melbourne or in Sydney? And in fact, we're interested because we steal what's already good and bring it back to Holland and make our network better. It goes both ways, right? I mean, Australia is not a third world country, it is excellent care. 
So what is good, you keep. And we ask you, what are your challenges in your country? And you mentioned a challenge. And then we say, we're Subway. We've got sandwiches, ham, olives, lettuce, tomatoes. And you pick what you like to improve your offerings. And you may not like lettuce on your sandwich. Mm -hmm. And you may not like the mayonnaise. So you customize your sandwich. So Parkinson Net Norway was customized to the needs of Norway. And they picked out of our offerings what, 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 what they liked. Our network in California doesn't have our IT solutions. Because Kaiser Permanente said, we've got kp.org. We already have it. So OK, fine. So we're now, we, we've completed the first round of discussions with Parkinson's Victoria, which is now called Fight Parkinson's. And I hope, I hope it will work. And then it can spread to Sydney and other parts. Because the other, the other thing we learned is we bring all the knowledge to Australia. So you're not dependent on the Dutch. We live at the other side of the planet. So everything we know, all the tricks, will be brought to a team in Australia, and then we withdraw. So Norway and Luxembourg are now independent. The only thing we do is we bring the super trooper experts once a year together, and they learn from each other. So Luxembourg, Norway, Kaiser, China, Australia, they meet. And that's wonderful. So you create an international community of experts who make each other better and better. This is the answer to your question. Hands up if you'd one like up one. One up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Now, She's some people have been very, very patient. She's got the microphone. <laughs> yes, she has. That's yeah, wonderful don't patience. Don't Thank don't you. Don't okay. Yeah, yeah, can you put the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth and then we'll hear if you hear you. How's that? Yes. Not bad. Pretty okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Bess. I'm, I'm a, a person with Parkinson's disease diagnosed 10 years ago, patient of Simon's. Thank you, Simon, for bringing Bass here for us to sit, see and listen to it. It's been so inspiring. Um, and I, on a much um, smaller scale, but which may be of interest to you, Bass, and certainly it involves several people in this room, is an organisation called Dance for Parkinson's, uh, which has been in Australia now for 10 years. <coughs> and it involves teaching dance, teaching by professional dance teachers of, um, you know, routines <coughs> adapted if necessary to be safe for pe people with Parkinson's. Normally people would go once a week to a free class in their local area. <coughs> and um, if often people come as a couple, um, the carer and the person with Parkinson's, where if, and sadly this happens a lot, the, the person with Parkinson's uh, passes away, their partner is welcome to keep coming, and a lot of people in the groups are in fact partners or, or of people who've passed away. And um, last, last week, we, had, we performed in the Sydney Dance Company studio at Walsh Bay, and we had an incredible time, and I think we showed one of the great things about it is that you show that we are normal human beings who still can still do things physically and have fun. So I just want to let you know about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you're willing to share, um, you email you the link. I can put that out when we do the, the follow-up email after this event. We're going to take one last question. Oh, look, please. I've so got sorry. the mic. Is that a, just a quick question. I'm a late entrant and I'm 80 years of age. Did my son tell you? My, my ail, yeah, coming up the question. I have 19 ailments. I've got two friends who are 76 years of age, and recently they were diagnosed as having Parkinson's. What have I got to look out for as I go into my 82nd year or whatever uh, going forward? What have I got to do to make sure I don't get Parkinson's? Is there any sort of like fail safe uh, sort of like route I can take or set of processes I can undertake? Sure. So, so you, you keep it at bay. So, yeah. So you turned 80. I'm wondering what on earth are you guys putting in the drinking water here? Because it's, <laughs> I, I want to have that water too. I'm last for 55 right. <laughs> I can imagine. So, uh, I, and I received that question actually during coffee. So it's an excellent question. If you are concerned about developing Parkinson's, for example, in your children or other loved ones, the few things that I recommend is exercise. Exercise helps to prevent Parkinson's. It's the Mediterranean diet. It's a few cups of coffee. It's avoiding excessive exposure to da dairy products, high amounts. Don't avoid dairy products altogether. Also, when you have Parkinson's, you need the calcium for the bones. 
you need the proteins for your muscles, but avoid peaks in proteins and avoid excessive dairy products and steer away from pesticides when you can. Eat biological, wash your veggies, wash your you know, fruit, uh, and, th and that would be my recipe. And be optimistic. And just here. Uh, sorry, what's the last question, right? Yes, please. Actually, it's not a question that I was after. Um, I just have relate to all this uh, that with Parkinson's is a, a little verse that I have in 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 adversity all round. True character is found, but there be solace in adversity when solutions are found. Now I say that uh, in in sincere thanks for all of us here for the contribution that you have put together with this presentation, and I think uh, the experts are standing there right before us right now in what they have presented to us. Thank you very much.